Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I have a talk here on contributions of NOAA GLORAL and collaborators to biophysical modeling in the Great Lakes. And this isn't really a comprehensive review, but rather, uh, you know, I was looking back through the papers and the tech memos and so forth, and these were things that kind of caught my attention as being interesting and influential um, on my work as well as for others. So first I'll just say what I mean by biophysical modeling. Um, so I'm talking about linked physical and biogeochemical lower food web models. Uh, they typically consist of linked sets of differential equations based on conservation of mass of limiting nutrients or other constituents and process rates that may be experimentally determined. Uh, the applications include nutrient management decision support, uh, forecasts and exploring and understanding physical and biogeochemical mechanisms influencing ecological endpoints. So um, one of the first generation of GLORAL scientists uh, was Don Scavia, and he had a lot of influence on um, water quality and ecological modeling over his career, uh, but early years at GLORAL. And this is one example of a paper um, in which GLORAL in the early years and throughout, I uh, was conducting a lot of measurements of important process rates in the lakes, uh, planktonic production, grazing, sedimentation. And so, and from the early years, applying models to synthesize that information and make predictions. So in this case, uh, they were looking at the effect of uh, top-down effects on control of the phytoplankton community composition. So looking at, uh, alewife, which were an abundant invader in uh, Lake Michigan, uh, predation on zooplankton, and then selective grazing by zooplankton on phytoplankton, having an influence on the community composition, and making predictions that at higher alewife abundance could lead to recurrence of filamentous blue-green algae in Lake Michigan, and further predicting that uh, with the invasion of bifotrephes into the lakes, which is another predator on zooplankton that could be somewhat analogous to the role of alewife in the system could also enhance uh, the abundance of blue-green algae. So just an example of how these sorts of models have been applied over the years. And then at the same time, uh, Dave Schwab and others were developing some of these first uh, electronic spatial data sets that would underpin later development of numerical ocean models for the lakes. And then uh, also among the first generation scientists at GLORAL was Steve Chopra, who also had um, a lot of influence on water quality modeling uh, throughout his career, uh, but got his start at GLORAL. And so this is an example of a linked multi-box model simulating long-term response of lake phosphorus concentrations to changing loads. Now in this type of model, the physical part is the representation of the interconnections among the lakes and the residence time um, in the different lakes and sub-basins. And this type of model can be run for long-term simulations, 100 years or more, and show the effect of the interconnections of the lakes on long-term evolution of uh, concentrations of constituents in the lakes. And this model is influential in the initial setting of phosphorus loading targets under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And when I was a graduate student at Michigan Tech working uh, or taking Marty Hours water quality modeling class, we work with some of these linked lake models. And it's a really interesting tool to see the, the long-term influence of the interconnection among the lakes. And so, yeah, Steve Chopper worked with those types of models uh, throughout his career. And here's a updated version of that Great Lakes phosphorus model from 2012. And in this case, they were able to show the impact of the quagga mussel invasion in terms of uh, removing total phosphorus from the water column and transferring it to the sediments because in their model, they needed to recalibrate the net settling for phosphorus uh, after the 90s when the mussels invaded. Um, so this, about this time in 2012, um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was updated and it included objectives for nearshore water quality as well as offshore. And that presented a challenge because it's difficult to monitor nearshore water quality because it's so variable. 
and also difficult to model because of the dynamic influences on nearshore water quality. So these past generations of models that were more um, spatially uh, aggregated, um, you know, couldn't really do nearshore water quality. So looking at um, some more spatially resolved models. Um, so there's this tech memo from Schwab and Beletsky in 1998, where they applied a five kilometer grid Princeton Ocean model to Lake Michigan and simulated 94, 95 hydrodynamics. And this was in support of the Lake Michigan mass balance study, which was a big multi-agency intensive field campaign. And this uh, hydrodynamic modeling that they did supported various modeling efforts at EPA over the years. So this is one uh, model that came out of this, this LM3 UTRO model from this 2008 paper by James Power. So again, this is based on this five kilometer grid Princeton Ocean model uh, that Glorel contributed. And so in this kind of moderate resolution model, this is kind of the first a model that could kind of begin to resolve the differences between nearshore and offshore water quality. And I had an opportunity to work with that model when I was a postdoc at EPA, and I worked on improved representation of the nitrogen budget in that model. So again, working with those chloral hydrodynamics. Um, and we found in this study that a large internal loss of nitrogen was needed to balance the nitrogen budget and attributed that to coupled nitrification, denitrification at the sediment surface. And that was uh, by referencing denitrification rates that had been measured by Wayne Gardner and others at Glural in the 80s. Um, so moving on to um, modeling that was in support of the episodic events and Great Lakes Experiment Eagle project uh, in 97 through 2001. And so in this paper by Chen and, and many collaborators from Glural, they applied a two kilometer Princeton Ocean model to Lake Michigan and used that to drive this uh, one dimensional vertical biophysical model that had a phosphorus limited lower food web representation. And in this 1D vertical simulation, it had enough vertical resolution that they could begin to resolve the deep chlorophyll layer in these simulations. And a further application of that same model, um, again, along with a long list of Glural and Sigler or Siler collaborators, um, they did a 3D application of that model and the two kilometer Princeton Ocean model. And so uh, this is one of the first cases when they were able to produce detailed simulations of spatial patterns of chlorophyll in Southern Lake Michigan and make comparisons to satellite remote sensing imagery. So here's another example of, um, by Schwab and others, the application of a two kilometer grid Princeton Ocean model to Lake Erie and using that to drive a two dimensional vertically averaged total phosphorus model. And so this type of model can be used to show the influence of specific tributary inputs on nearshore water quality and spatial patterns of total phosphorus in the lake. So by turning on or turning off, um, rivers and the model simulations, we can see what impact specific rivers have on nearshore water quality in the lake. And that can help to direct um, restoration activities towards specific watersheds. And this paper uh, by Chen and others showed the importance of flexible model grids for being able to simulate dynamic nearshore currents in the Great Lakes. So in this example, uh, they were able to simulate the Keweenaw current in Lake Superior that uh, previous generations of structure grid models uh, weren't able to represent. So at the same time, Chen and others were developing the FVCOM model, which became adopted at Glural uh, for the next generation of the Great Lakes forecast system. Um, so building on that, uh, here's a paper with uh, Lin Lo and Jia Wang where they applied a three-dimensional uh, biophysical model, again, phosphorus limited lower food web model. And with the spatial detail in this model, particularly in the case, you know, with the FECOM models, the, the model grid can conform to the 
coastline morphology. So we have realistic coastline shapes that wasn't possible with the previous structured grid models and also enhanced resolution in the nearshore areas. So we can really begin to model spatial patterns and nearshore water quality. So in this case, um, they were able to simulate uh, spatial patterns of chlorophyll in the spring bloom with comparison to satellite remote sensing and simulation of the deep chlorophyll layer. So then um, I was able to build on that work starting as postdoc at uh, Glural. And so here's similar application of a phosphorus limited lower food web model. But in this case, we added uh, dracenid mussels because we wanted to see the impacts of dracenid mussels on the phytoplankton community. And we also added uh, tributary inputs of phosphorus from uh, 38 locations, building on the, the work of uh, Dolan and Chopra on the loadings. So here, uh, these two on the left are satellite remote sensing imagery of chlorophyll uh, from April 2010. So this is the traditional time of the spring phytoplankton bloom when the water column is vertically well mixed. And the right three figures are three different model simulations. Uh, so in this one was a simulation that included the quagga mussels and tributary nutrient inputs. And at the red area, arrows there, you can see areas of depleted chlorophyll that we can see in the satellite imagery as well as the models. With the models, we can turn things on and off to kind of isolate what's causing that. So when we turn off the influence of the quagga mussels, that uh, traditional pattern of the spring phytoplankton bloom comes back. So that allows us to isolate the effect of the uh, quagga mussel filter feeding on the phytoplankton abundance. And then by turning off the tributary nutrient inputs, we can show that um, the tributary nutrient inputs are able to maintain higher productivity in nearshore areas, even in the presence of the quagga mussels. And moving on to more recent work. Um, so we applied to the uh, Lake Michigan Huron FECOM model that was developed by Eric Anderson and others. We applied the same biophysical model to that uh, model domain that I was talking about previously. And we did this for the uh, 2020 through 2022 Lake Michigan Huron CSMI. And one of the science questions for the CSMI was nearshore to offshore exchange of tributary nutrient inputs. Um, so we wanted to investigate that. So this model had about 200 meter resolution at the coast and two kilometers offshore, um, 78 rivers in Lake Michigan, 88 rivers in Lake Huron. And we actually ran real time simulations of this model in support of the CSMIs so that uh, field research investigators who were out there could see some of these transient near soar phenomena and potentially investigate them as they were happening. And this is depending on USGS estimates of uh, total phosphorus loading using Sparrow models and their gauge network. So we also matched up comparisons to satellite remote sensing chlorophyll from Coastwatch. And we were able to identify some interesting features like this bloom of enhanced chlorophyll and productivity that wraps around the foam area of Michigan from Saginaw Bay down to uh, the St. Clair River. And so this is a series of animations that Peter Alsip showed earlier this week in the CSMI session, showing some of these dynamic plumes of enhanced productivity uh, coming out of Saginaw Bay, wrapping around the foam, and then uh, largely getting kind of sucked out the St. Clair River. So now, does this really exist? There was some information for it you know, some evidence for it in the satellite remote sensing, but it's also an example of how there can be a back and forth between modeling and field investigations, uh, because this is a thing that could easily be missed in uh, field investigations that weren't specifically trying to target it. And then flashback to 1975. So this is one of the tech memos where um, uh, Glural researchers mapped out the circulation pattern of Saginaw Bay, totally based on observations from drifters and current meters. And so they're showing um, inflow of water along the North Shore and outflow of water along the South Shore 
and then that gets entrained into a north to south coastal current in Lake Huron. So, you know, they did this completely based on observations, but now we're able to simulate uh, that, cir that circulation pattern and also the impacts of it on bait and transport of nutrients using numerical models. So in summary, the biophysical modeling efforts build on Glorial strengths, including ecological and biogeochemical observations and experiments, physical observations and remote sensing, and application of numerical ocean models to the Great Lakes. Uh, Glorial is engaged in biophysical model development over 50 years. Uh, the multiple box models have enabled long-term simulations of biogeochemistry, and spatially detailed models enable uh, simulation of the complex nearshore currents and bait and transport of the tributary nutrient inputs. And model development has often accompanied intensive field studies. So thanks for your attention today. Thanks, Mark. And we do have time for some questions. like towards more biogeochemical modeling or application to like more uh, lakes, like additional lakes? Um, yeah, I mean, I see the potential for incorporating additional detail in terms of biogeochemistry and ecology into these models. And then also application to additional lakes. I mean, certainly Lake Erie is, is a big challenge you know, because it's so complex in many ways and important in terms of the, um, you know, issues that it has that we're trying to resolve. So certainly more effort in the area of Lake Erie and trying to get more kind of realistic representations in the models of the lower food web ecology and biogeochemistry. Just, just a comment. Uh, before Mark uh, moved to grow as a postdoc to conduct uh, 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 the, the ecosystem modeling. And the previous year, and grow scientists only uh, collaborate with outside uh, scientists. We don't own the code. We don't own the computer code. So I think that is a very, very important uh, uh, to, well, for me to mention, you know, Mark is the first generation of the uh, biophysical modeler at Go. So, thanks, Yeah. But also building on the past work that I wanted to highlight in this presentation. <laughs>